So we are having a little runoff today. Uh, who is currently a PhD student in London Business School, and um, uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, his supervisor David Myers, I guess, yeah, um, uh, gave him a reference. Is uh, also was my teacher well, well, in my time when I was in Oxford, and uh, everyone knew David is. A really harsh marker, and if you get a good mark from him, that means that you're really, really good. And uh, so, basically, the reference he gave to Alec was well, excellent. And uh, he said, especially when I was impressed and when I was reading through the reference, and I think this is the paper that Alec is going to present actually, that uh, David was discussing that paper with someone. And Alec was, I think, either present or just during that talk or something, but literally within 10 minutes or something. And the next day, Alec came to David saying, well, this is basically the solution, I suggest, the way of solving this problem. And David was really impressed because he didn't expect that anything would come out of the discussion, but in fact, it did, there was a serious good result coming out of, of that paper. Um, so this is a result of 10 minutes of reflection. Well, not quite, they went, <laughs> but there was like yeah, one bright idea. Yeah, so, well, um, uh, th this one thing. Another thing is that before this talk, we actually spoke with Alec about what he should really present here. And one thing was this paper, another thing is uh, paper in progress on um, um, pre-election uh, opinion polls, and which would be more potentially interested to our politics students and uh, politics uh, members of the Department of Politics and Sociology in the Embassy, uh, we decided that this topic is uh, probably less politically sensitive, so maybe it's better to, 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 to concentrate on this one. And uh, in addition, I just would like to mention separately that I'm really happy that Federer made it here, because uh, we are trying on the uh, city stage, we're trying to start some kind of proper collaboration between uh, people representing different universities and as far as economics in particular game theory is concerned. So it's really good to have that um, uh, Okay, yeah, so without further ado, I mean, you can sit down and you don't have to stand, so... Well, we'll see, maybe I'll sit down oh, at some okay, point. Okay. But first of all, I would like to say that you should realize the fact that most of us understand nothing in this stuff. Yeah, that's okay, fine. We, we, we you you will see that there are some. Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, shall I start? Yeah. Uh, all right, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, as you can see, the topic of my talk is chip talk with multiple senders. Let me start by giving you an example of what a chip talk situation is. Uh, imagine a government which wants to pass some law. So we have a government here, the US Congress, and they're discussing something. Uh, so they want to pass some law, but they don't know much about the issue they're discussing. What can they do if they don't know much about the issue they're about to uh, pass a law about? Uh, they can invite some experts. So I have an example. They have a standard procedure. So here <coughs> they uh, invited some experts uh, in this case, about the North Korean nuclear problem. Well, actually, I put this uh, photo a long time ago, and I think it's very relevant now. Just like yesterday, there were some tests. <laughs> uh, to ask them what the situation in North Korea is, and what they, sh what, uh, they sh shall do. Uh, <clears throat> and then these experts can sh share their opinions. So let me give you another example of a law they might be discussing. It might be a law about environmental protection. So the Senate uh, decides to pass a law on environmental protection and it invites an expert. So the expert knows more than the government about, the, about environmental protection, therefore uh, it makes sense to ask the expert. The problem is that the interest of the expert might be different from my interests my uh, meaning the government, uh, the government's interests, therefore uh, it's not clear why I should trust the expert. For example, the expert might be Greenpeace if we are passing a law on animal protection. So even though we, we probably believe that Greenpeace knows more about animal protection than the government does, 
<clears throat> if I just believe Greenpeace, I would expect that uh, it would try to push me into the in the direction of more environmental protection. Then probably knowing what Greenpeace knows, I, uh, I the government would do myself. Uh, another example might be so this is what, it's, what is called bias in cheap talk literature. So since the interests of Greenpeace are not exactly the same as the interests of the government, I don't take any stand here who is correct, whether it's Greenpeace or the government, but just since the government is the decision maker and wants to know the true state of the world, let's call this difference in opinions bias. So Greenpeace is biased in our terms. Uh, I could have asked some other experts, for example, a big manufacturer, then the manufacturer would be biased in the, in the opposite direction. Also, a big manufacturer might know a lot about environmental protection because they need to implement lots of these uh, CO2 cap uh, emissions, uh, caps on CO2 emissions or some other measures to prevent, uh, uh, to protect the environment. Therefore, they might be experts themselves in environmental protection, but if I ask their opinion, they would say that we don't need that much environmental protection. <clears throat> what I can do instead, I can, or like in addition to that, I can ask several experts, both the manufacturer and Greenpeace, or maybe I can start asking more, uh, more environmental protection uh, organizations, or more manufacturers, or some experts who are maybe less biased as compared to me. So the the question my paper asks is whether it's possible to improve information transmission, so how much I know about the true state of affairs if I ask more experts. And they will show that it's possible to improve information transmission, so how much I know about how much environmental protection we really should have uh, if we ask more experts. Uh, so now let's go to definitions, more technical things. So, uh, cheap talk is the situation which we alternatively can call strategic information transmission. We have an informed sender, so the expert, and then the uninformed receiver, and then the informed receiver, so the government. And then <coughs> uh, the receiver's action, so in this case the severity of the law on environmental protection, uh, affects both. So if we have a strict law, then uh, the, in, uh, the expert is happy, Greenpeace is happy, uh, but other things equal, I want, uh, in this, if I realize that indeed we need more environmental protection, I should signal somehow that there should be more environmental protection. Uh, so there are some other examples of such interaction uh, where we have an informed sender and an informed receiver, for example, lobbying groups or uh, Maybe you know that grades in universities inflate over time. So what uh, uh, A or B means sort of uh, <laughs> means less and less over time. So you get an A for worse results over time. Uh, so uh, the, the important thing here is that, I mean, obviously if our interests are perfectly aligned, so I asked the expert and the expert uh, exactly wants me to pass the law, I, I, I mean, my, my interests are exactly the same as the interests of the government, then of course there's no incentive for me to lie. So th there's no question here. But as long as our interests are not perfectly aligned, it's not clear whether information transmission is possible or not. <coughs> so exactly the, the question I'm asking is whether it's possible to improve information transmission with multiple centers. Uh, there is a paper about that when we just speak about one expert and one uh, government, so one uh, sender and one receiver. So the government is uh, called the, uh, the, the receiver, so also the decision maker, and the experts are called uh, uh, are called senders because they send me some information about the state of the world. <clears throat> uh, so Prof and Sobel look at the following setting, they say, let's, let's say there is some state of the world, somewhere between zero and one, so how much uh, environmental protection 
it's optimal to have for, for the government. Uh, so my current belief about how much environmental protection there should be is given by f of theta. Uh, so you can, for now, imagine that it's a uniform distribution of zero one, so anything can be. Uh, then the sender observes this true state of the world, so the environmental organization knows how much uh, environmental protection would be optimal for the government. Would be optimal for the government? For the government, yes. So they know what is optimal for the government? Or at least they know what is optimal to, to them, so they can track back. They know our difference in opinions, so they can figure out what's optimal for the government. Uh, so they can send some message to M of theta, which depends on the true state of the world and the information they have. And then, <clears throat> based on that message, M, the sender can, uh, the receiver can take some action A. So this is how strict the law is on environmental protection. Uh, so these two uh, agents have utility functions, which depend both on A and theta. The easiest way to think about it is that if the true state of the world is theta, I want to take, as a government, I want to take an action which is exactly theta, so I want to guess the state of the world, while uh, the uh, sender wants, uh, has some bias B, so would like, uh, would like, ideally would like me to, to take an action which is equal to theta plus B. So if I have a positive bias, I want a stricter law on environmental protection, so I want the government to pass a stricter law on environmental protection. Uh, so Prof and Sobel showed in uh, 1982 that uh, they found all possible equilibria in this situation. And for example, in the situation where these uh, functions are quadratic uh, with maximum at theta and theta plus b, uh, they found that if the bias is uh, greater than one quarter, so if the expert is very biased com com as compared to the government, then uh, the only possible equilibrium is babbling. So whatever the expert says, uh, the government doesn't take into account, and <clears throat> the, the expert doesn't have any incentive to say something meaningful because this is not taken into account. So this is an equilibrium. I just say something which doesn't depend on the true state of affairs, and then the government doesn't take it into account. Okay. What is uh, this game? This is uh, an equilibrium sum game for my book? Yes, so the, the uh, expert observes the state of the world, and just knows the state of the world theta, and then sends a message m of theta yeah. to the receiver, and then the receiver takes an action a. Ah, okay. So, so uh, ideally, the the receiver wants to match theta. So to, to, to take an action which is equal to theta, since there's some ambiguity, it might on average be equal to theta. Could you explain again what is the difference between, or what is the connection between M of theta and B? Uh, what, what is B? So let, let me actually show you the next slide. Uh, so this would be the utility function of the receiver. So this is depending on the action uh, the receiver takes. So if uh, the receiver managed to guess the true state of the world theta, so to take an action equal to theta, then uh, the receiver gets the maximum utility. If, uh, if she didn't guess where the true state of the world is, then her utility will be uh, less. On the other hand, if we look at the utility function of the sender, then the sender's utility function is actually maximized at a different point, theta plus b. So I want to communicate uh, something to the government in such a way that the government actually takes a, a stricter action, like a higher action. The utility functions are identical up to a shift? Uh, no, no, no. They, are, uh, they don't, don't have to be identical. And There's just know? some family of of, uh, and, and B is just some sort of individual bias, or what is it? So. Uh, B is, yes, is the individual bias, so our difference in uh, opinions, yeah, in, but but the in preferences. Uh, the, the function uh, uh, you, uh, of, of, is increasing to B or decreasing to one to B? 
Uh, yes, so it's maximized at theta plus b. So for, of course, they will be different for different thetas, but for every theta, I want a higher action as compared to the to the decision maker to the Does government know me? Yes. So here we assume that the government knows me. Although, uh, like for the original result, it's not important. I will tell you how it's important it is for me uh, later after I give you the result, whether we know B or not. But uh, the important question is, even if I know the bias, can I still extract anything from the expert in it? So this is the <coughs> setting. Uh, so let's go back to that slide. It turns out that if um, we just have one expert and one, so one sender and one receiver, then if the, their interests are very different, there's no information transmission. If their interests are quite different, but still, uh, so you might, doesn't yeah, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> so if you look at the second interval, uh, so if our interests are quite different, but not like that much different. So if the bias is between one twelfth and one quarter, and our utility functions were quadratic, then it turns out that there's another equilibrium where uh, I just send some type of signal for low uh, states of the world, and then some other type of signal for high states of the world. So I either say low or high, uh, but I don't say where exactly on these sub-intervals the state of the world is. So it turns out that the only other possible equilibrium is this uh, partition into two intervals. So if the biases become smaller and smaller, then uh, we can get finer and finer partitions, but still for any positive bias, there's only a finite number of these intervals in the partition, so there's not much information I can transmit. So the question is, if I start asking several experts, can I improve this information transmission? So, I <clears throat> already covered this. Uh, so this is the general model. We can have any single peak functions. So the utility function of the sender is maximized at theta plus b. The utility function of the receiver is maximized at theta. So they can be any single peak or uh, uh, quasi concave utility functions. Uh, so there is one benchmark case which is used to compare results in, uh, between different papers, which uh, I will also speak about. For example, those thresholds for, like when we have only one interval or two intervals or three intervals were given for exactly this case, benchmark case, so that we can uh, compare results between different papers. Uh, so there we will have the utility function of the uh, receiver is quadratic and maximizes theta. The utility function of the sender is maximized at theta plus b. And all the senders are the same because b doesn't. Oh, so far we just have one, so I'm describing the original model. Uh, <clears throat> so now I will introduce several experts. So, uh, actually, I, I want to give you an example. So. This was the model for just one expert. Now let's see what happens with several experts. If you think there's actually a very easy way to construct an equilibrium with full regulation with just two experts, but I will show you what is wrong with this uh, equilibrium. And so all papers which uh, in, in the one-dimensional world showed full regulation, uh, they suffered from from this problem I would expect. So, assume that we have two senders with positive biases. There's a, the following equilibrium with full relation. Let's say we have two biases who both observe, uh, two senders who observe the state of the world theta. And then, <coughs> uh, in the equilibrium, they both send, uh, send me a message which is exactly equal to the state of the world theta. Now, uh, I can construct an equilibrium where I exactly know the state of the world theta. Uh, so if I know that the state of the world, that if I know that both senders sent me the same signal, then I know that it must be theta. 
So obviously, if I get two thetas, two, two messages equal to the same number, I should take an action which is equal to, to that. Okay. But uh, uh, what, what is the difference between M1 and M2 if, if they are equal to zero? So here, no difference. But the question is, if someone deviates, what, what happens if someone deviates? So we want to check if it's indeed a Nash equilibrium or not. So a strat the strategy of each player must be uh, a best response to the strategies of other players. So are, are we that uh, biases are both one? Yeah, this is just for the sake of this example. Uh, I will give you an example of an equilibrium where there is full relation, but I will show that there is a problem with it. Later on, I will deal with uh, problems which don't suffer from this problem. So, <clears throat> uh, no one has an incentive to deviate if I take an action which is equal to the minimum of two messages. Uh, why is that? Well, you can you imagine a situation where so I'm on the job market now, so I had some reference letters written to me. So we have a university, so a European university, which looks at these letters, and then it tries to figure out what my level is. So let's say that my, my advisors want me to actually, uh, you know, score higher than I actually am. So let's assume that they have positive biases. Who knows? Maybe they don't. He has incentives to overvalue your merits. Exactly. It's necessary. Exactly. So in this situation, the European University will look at the two letters, and if they report the same quality of the candidate, the same quality for me, then you trust uh, what they say. But if they send, for some reason, different signals, then you take just the worst of the two signals. So there, there is no incentive for any of the uh, for any of this uh, reference letter writer. Oh, first of all, the university is already doing the best it can if it thinks that the two senders are playing these strategies, because it, it got two identical letters. Since I assume that. Uh, both were supposed to, to report the true quality, then uh, individually none of the uh, letter writers should deviate. Uh, would any of the senders deviate? Well, one of the uh, letter writers might write a worse letter, but this will only do worse for me because then European University will look at my letter, at the two letters, and only take take the worst one into account. So we don't want that. Uh, I, alternatively, one of the senders could write a better letter. Well, in that case, it wouldn't affect what the uh, European University thinks of me because, uh, because there's already a worse letter written by the other reference letter writer. Uh, therefore, I don't have an incentive to deviate. So none of the reference letter writers have incentives to deviate. Therefore, it's an equilibrium, and we perfectly transmit all the information. The, no, no, there are equilibria. I can also not trust anyone and just throw away the letters. <laughs> if they know that I will do that, they will also write some nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I didn't want to deviate to the right because I thought that there was one guy who already wrote like a, a, a bad letter for me. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it doesn't really harm me to deviate to the right here. So, uh, I like uh, writing a better letter would also be a best response to what other pe people do. It will not be a uh, Nash equilibrium, but it would be a best response. So now if I introduce a little bit of perturbation to this model, so now uh, the two standards don't perfectly observe the true state of the world theta, but they only observe the true state of the world theta with some probability 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon can be very small. But with some small probability epsilon, they observe some noise. In this case, uh, so let's say we know all the distributions and everything. In this case, it's actually strictly better for me to write a better letter because now I know that there is a small probability that 
the other letter, the other letter writer uh, got a different signal and would have written a different report. So there is some probability that he would write a better letter. In that case, me writing a better letter would change what the university thinks of me, of uh, the candidate. Therefore, <clears throat> uh, now it's strictly better for me to write a better letter. So if I introduce this small perturbation, uh, uh, these strategies are no longer optimal. So the problem is actually there was something wrong about beliefs of, uh, of the university of the equilibrium path. So when we got two different letters, I, I for some reason thought that the guy who wrote a worse letter uh, was the, the guy not lying. And like I was sure that that was the case. So now having this in mind, uh, I'm asking, can we have something, uh, can we have an equilibrium uh, which would survive this introduction of small amount of noise? but would still uh, have more information transmission than the situation with one sender. Uh, so, uh, let me skip this equilibrium concept. Okay, uh, the equilibrium concept will be, we have N senders, they all observe the true state of the world theta, or maybe some signal about the true state of the world theta, but uh, when, uh, so the signal is usually equal to theta. If we introduce a little bit of noise, sometimes it's equal to something else. So they observe this true, true state of the world theta with high probability. And then uh, based on their signal, they will all send me messages. I will show that actually there exists an equilibrium with a lot of information transmission, even if they are restricted to only sending two types of signals. It will help if uh, they're not very biased if we send more types of signals, but I will show that even with two types of signals, it, it will be enough to get a lot of information transmission with sufficiently many uh, senders. And so the equilibrium concept will be perfect Bayesian equilibrium and will require uh, that when the uh, noise gets smaller, the equilibrium should converge to the equilibrium with no noise. So let me, this is the theorem I'm, uh, I'm proving. It might look scary, let me just in words explain what's happening here. I'm saying if all the biases are sufficiently small, then there exists an equilibrium where uh, the precision of information transmission converges to zero exponentially fast. So here it says two to the power minus n. So it means that uh, I know you remember these partitions, so I have a partition where the size of each element is very small. It's uh, 1 over 2 to the power n, if n is the number of samples. So this, <clears throat> what does it mean, a very, uh, not very big bias? Well, we have this benchmark case with uniform prior distribution and quadratic uh, utility functions. There it means that the bias is less than one quarter. Remember that in the original Prof and Sobel result, when the bias was less than one quarter, uh, sorry, greater than one quarter, there was no information transmission. So only bevelling equilibrium. When the bias was just less than one quarter, there only two, two elements in the partition. So I only knew if the state of the world was low or high. Now, once, once we move below one quarter, we have asymptotically full relation. So let's look how we construct an equilibrium. Remember that I just restricted myself to sending only two types of signals, zeros and ones. I mean, it might be zeros and ones, it might be low, high, or uh, my favorite interpretation is just whether the expert called me or didn't call me. So in that case, it's, uh, it's not even uh, an option for, for the expert to participate or not in this algorithm because if, uh, if the expert didn't call me, I know that I interpret it as the first type of signal. If uh, the expert called me, I interpret it as the second type of signal. So since the expert can only send two types of signals, what kind of strategy can uh, he play? Well, there will be some intervals where the first sender plays zeros, some intervals where he plays ones. So we'll have like zeros, ones, zeros, ones. 
So this is an example of such strategy. Now, <clears throat> if I just had one sender playing this strategy, what would be uh, the information set, the information structure from the point of view of the receiver? Well, the receiver only gets these messages about the state of the world. So if we are on the first interval, the receiver knows that, uh, that the first uh, sender sends zero. If we are in the second uh, interval, the receiver knows that there is the one, zero, and one. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, I know that I will send zero somewhere, one somewhere. So. It's a second round for. Oh, no, no, so far it's, it's, it's only. It's a very simple example. It's a very simple question. Very simple so here, let's say one means that I call. Call? What is the question? For, uh, I, I, I need some information about what? So, I'm for example, how much information, uh, environmental protection we should have? Or like the quality of the candidate. Okay. So the quality of the candidate, let's say. So the first sender, the first uh, letter writer, decides to write a letter or not write a letter. Mm -hmm. But he writes a letter if the quality is somewhere in the middle or very high, but not in these two instruments. So this is a, an example of a strategy. So if we only had one sender, this would be the information structure from the point of view of the receiver. I know that on this interval um, I don't get a letter, and on these intervals I get a letter. Now I can add another sender into this mechanism. Now we have sender 2. Also since I only send two types of messages, I will have some sort of partition where on even intervals I send ones or on the not zeros or the other way around. So <clears throat> now I can look at the intersection of these two uh, like message mechanisms. So now I have two, a two digit uh, information. So if I'm on the first uh, interval, I will get zero one. If I'm somewhere in the second interval, I will get one one. On the third interval, I'll get one zero, etc. So it's a, it's a yeah. Yes, yes. So now, now I introduce the third sender, the, it uh, will get even a finer partition. So if the senders play only zeros and ones, this is the only thing which can happen. Uh, will this partition be uniform at the... In, in the one I construct, yes. So uh, in fact we will get a diameter representation of any number of zero one, and each uh, <coughs> sender uh, sends us... Uh, in a sense, but it doesn't work that straightforward. Though. I, I will show you how it works. Yeah. So it will actually be the opposite. But yes, we get a finer and finer partition. Just every point is coded not like in the way you are thinking about it. But it's coded in a very different way. So now uh, <clears throat> we can look at this uh, final partition we get, the information structure from the point of view of the receiver. And then we can think of what the receiver would do if this was the information structure. Well, this is not a very good example here because uh, I, I know that not all possible combinations of messages happen. For example, uh, 000, 000 doesn't appear here. And then another problem is that uh, the combination of messages uh, 010 happens twice. So this is a uh, dis disconnected set, so which is not very nice. So I know that the true state of the world is here or there, so my optimal response will be somewhere in the middle, so I want to avoid that. So in the, in the equilibrium I construct, I will have exactly 2 to the power n intervals. So each sender sends two types of messages, so there are 2 to the power n possible combinations of zeros and ones. So I'll have exactly 2 to the power n uh, intervals, and each interval is coded uniquely. So we have a unique combination of messages. So this is an example of a proper partition. So something my, uh, my equilibrium will satisfy. So here we have three senders, and each sender sends a zero or a one. So we'll have exactly uh, eight, two to the power three is eight, 
uh, elements in this partition. Uh, I want to <coughs> construct this partition in a way that no one wants to deviate from the strategy he's supposed to play. Uh, what will be the best response from the receiver? Well, the receiver knows that the state of the world is on one of the small intervals after receiving uh, this combination of messages. So I know that the true state of the world is somewhere in this small interval, so my optimal action should be also somewhere in this small interval. So we know what the, uh, what the receiver will do. Will the uh, senders deviate? Well, that's an interesting question. What, uh, how can I deviate? For example, let's look at the first interval. On the first interval, if the straight state of the world was somewhere between 0 and 1 eighth, then all senders were supposed to send 0. Now, will I send 0 if I'm supposed to send uh, 0? Well, uh, it depends on what happens if I deviate. Let's say I was the first sender and they deviated. Then instead of 0, 0, 0, the receiver will get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is an interval sort of far away from the original position. This is interval number 5. So it's if instead, instead of 0, I will send 1, then instead of 0, 0, 0, the receiver gets 1, 0, 0, 0. So if I make sure that that deviation is very far away, even a person with a positive bias would not want to deviate. Uh, so that's the idea of the equilibrium, to make sure that all possible deviations are very far away from the original point. Well, it's not actually a trivial task if you think about it, because there are 2 to the power n different intervals and n possible deviations everywhere. I will show that we can make every deviation almost one half away from the original point. So how do we do that? And that's the formal uh, uh, formulation of that result. Now, uh, yep. So it says whatever number below one half we take, uh, <clears throat> if uh, for sufficiently many senders we can organize the equilibrium in such a way that every deviation will be greater than this number below one half. <clears throat> I will demonstrate it on the, uh, for an example, with four senders, uh, how, how we'll proceed. So there's one interesting thing to notice when only one sender deviates, which is how we check whether it's an Nash equilibrium or not. So <clears throat> if we were supposed to send a combination of signals, let's say 0, 1, 0, 1, then uh, if we look at the sum of digits, if only one person deviates, the sum of digits changes by exactly one. So it means that this, if the sum of digits was even, it will become odd. If it was odd, it will become even. So it means I, uh, that I can put any number of uh, intervals with an even sum next to each other, and there will be no deviations between them. So what I can do is I can put all intervals, all codes with uh, even sums in the left half of the interval, and then all uh, intervals with uh, odd sums in the right half of the, of, of the interval. So there will be no deviations in the first half and in the second half. I might have a problem around one half because people might want to jump from odd to even somewhere around one half. So the way to deal with that problem is to also order all intervals by the sum of digits in each of the halves. So in the first half I will put first uh, all codes with the sum of digits zero. So there is only one such combination, zero, 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 zero. Then all uh, intervals with the sum of digits 2, so there are six of them, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, etc. You can see them there. And then the last thing will be uh, a combination of messages where their sum is 4. So I can do it for any n. Then I do the same thing for uh, an even, uh, for uh, odd 
uh, sums of digits. So it means that if I have a deviation, uh, if I was somewhere around one half, for example, in the right half, it means that I should have a small sum of digits, so here, for example, one. So if I deviate, I need to deviate either, from one I can deviate either to zero or to two, but zero and two were both in the, at the beginning of the other half of the interval. So if I deviate, I need to jump over all the intervals with the sum of digits four. Well, that, that's it here. But in general, if I had lots of thunders, then I need to jump and I deviate it from one to two from the sum, from sum of digits, actually let's say from the sum of digits three to sum of digits four. Then I needed to jump over all the intervals with the sum of digits one, with the sum of digits n, n minus two, etc. Can, can you prove that there is no way to improve for one, one half? There is a way to improve, okay, like two. <laughs> so it's sort of hard to improve it if you only have two types of messages. But if we use more types of messages, I'm sorry. Uh, if we took, uh, use more types of messages, I can improve the speed of convergence. But then I will have to have smaller biases. But I have this. In the case of two messages, is it possible to do better than one part? Oh, one part. Yeah. Uh, in the case of two messages, yeah, in uh, the, in the well, probably no, because we only have two to the power n possible combinations. So I cannot do finer than two to the power n. So, I mean, it depends on the criterion you use uh, to compare different situations. But in general, like, if I want a uniform partition, then I cannot do better than 2 to the power n, because if I do... I mean, yeah, I, 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 now I'm talking about uh, uh, the result if you are improving that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm proving that it exists. Yeah, uh, that there is such a way to code uh, yes. uh, some intervals uh, that uh, change in one digit uh, means a large jump. Yes. But uh, in your theory, the jump is uh, less than one half. Maybe you can. Yeah, slightly uh, less than one half. Yeah. Is so, so you're saying improving on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a reason to believe that we cannot do better than one half. Yeah, I, I also don't believe that we can. Because I, I, I ask, uh, can, can, can so it's not formulated here. But uh, if we are somewhere around one half, then I can only jump to the right or to the left. But there's nothing like close, I mean, closer than that difference, which is bigger than one half to the right or to the left. Okay, so yeah, there's yeah. no way to deviate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is like a technical <laughs> uh, side note. Uh, so in this way, I was just describing what happens if someone deviates. We can calculate this distance between the closest possible deviation. And if I cal uh, calculate the distance, basically I need to sum up all these binomial coefficients on the way. So it will be n choice <coughs> 1 plus n choice n plus n choice n minus 2 plus n choice n minus 4, etc. If you look at this sum, it will be more or less the sum of all odd or even binomial coefficients divided by 2 to the power n, so it converges to one half. I mean, th that sum is just equal to one half, but it will be slightly s smaller, but converging to one half. Uh, so that's, that's the mechanism. Uh, it is robust because if I introduce a little bit of noise, it doesn't change the beliefs of uh, people much. Because a small probability of someone mistaken means that I still, if I get a combination of 0, 0, 0, 0, I still believe that with, with a very high, for a small epsilons, I still believe with a very high probability that they were on that interval. Maybe with some small probabilities elsewhere. So it will, will not change my optimal action much. And now, <clears throat> Uh, currently, all senders strictly prefer what they are doing in every state of the world uh, to a possible deviation. So now the belief structure is slightly changed, but still, it, uh, if epsilons are small, 
I still strictly prefer that option to the other. So you can see that that function will be like a continuous function. So it doesn't drastically change my incentives once introduce a little bit of noise. Therefore, the equilibrium I construct is robust, unlike the uh, the one I showed with two senders at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, and it converges to full relation as the number of senders grows. Um, so yes, this, uh, this is what I said on this slide. Um, now, what happens if we can we introduce faster speed of convergence? My initial aim was to have very large biases and still have full relation. That's why I only use two types of signals, because if, they are all, if I only send two types of messages, it means that there are few things, uh, few, few things I can deviate to. Therefore, uh, like it's easier to satisfy that requirement. So th that's why there are only two types of messages the senders send here. But if I... <coughs> And so, so I said, once the biases are less than one quarter, we can achieve that. But if actually they are not as biased as in that, uh, like they were biased, but not as much, not one quarter, maybe all biases were less than one sixth. We know that one quarter is a very strict requirement because when the biases were higher than one quarter, with just one expert, there was no information transmission. So maybe the situation is not as bad. The, the experts are biased, but not may be extremely biased. So if, if the, all the biases were, let's say, less than one-tenth, then I can uh, build a more general construction where the speed of convergence will be 5 to the power minus n. So in general, if all the biases in absolute value are less than 1 over 2 k, I can <coughs> achieve speed of convergence k to the power minus n. So it will be a similar result. Uh, I think I will skip construction for now. Uh, so that's the question uh, you asked, whether larger biases would work. So if we are around one half, it shouldn't work. Uh, also, the equilibrium I construct here is quite specific. There are lots of jumps. So once uh, I send the same thing, and once uh, the state of the world slightly changes, suddenly I jump to sending a completely different signal. So maybe we could try think, uh, thinking about more continuous strategies. But if my <coughs> if the action of the receiver changed continuously depending on my action, then I'd always have an incentive to slightly change my action in a way that uh, uh, would move the state of uh, the action in the direction of my bias. So for example, one mechanism you could think of is just take all messages we get from different experts and take an average of them. So if I did that, then every single expert, if I'm positively biased, I would just try to send a higher message because I know that by just taking <coughs> the average of our messages, the uh, receiver will take the action equal to the state of the world. But now, if I say that actually we need a lot of inner protection, then uh, since I'm only one expert, the receiver will slightly change his uh, uh, action, so the policy he takes. But it's already better for me. So something like continuous strategies should not work, so we need some, some sort of jumps. And also having larger biases should not work, as I explained. So it seems like in, it's not a strict uh, proof here, but like the result I got is more or less as, as much as you can get. Uh, I also have some extensions. I can build a similar mechanism for multidimensional state spaces. So far, when we looked at the integral 0, 1, I can have any multidimensional state space and there I will slice it into small intervals and then also design it in a way that every deviation is far away. Then even in the multidimensional world, uh, still <coughs> they, they can uh, transmit the state of the world precise enough, I mean for enough senders. Uh, you can ask, well this relies a lot on that only one person deviates. 
well, this is partially true, but there is, if we only look, for example, at deviations of two senders, we can still, with sufficiently many agents, sufficiently many senders, we can still achieve coalition proofness if the coalitions cannot be more than two people. We can split them into five groups, and then each group, we ask each group to independently tell me what the state of the world is. So even if two people deviated, still I have three groups independently telling me what the state of the world is. And in that sense, it's coalition proof, but only for small coalitions. So if everyone could have deviated and everyone had the same bias, it would be more or less the same situation as just one sender and one receiver. So obviously it would not work. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so that's uh, the results I have. Yeah, I think more or less I took the time I was supposed to take. Uh, I looked at the situation of chip talk with multiple senders. I showed that it might make sense to add more senders, that we, we can improve information transmission. As the number of senders goes to infinity, exponentially fast we converge to full relation. Uh, the equilibrium I construct is robust to this small amount of noise, unlike uh, some other previous results or the example I, I showed you. And it also works for the smallest possible message space. So it would work also for biggest message spaces. For example, if I can send you a message, anything between 0 and 1, I can say, OK, let's think uh, of it in the following way. If I send you something between 0 and 1 half, you think of it as 0. If, you, if I send you something between 1 half and 1, you think of it as 1. Then if I just mix the same way between elements between 0 and 1 half and elements between 1 half and 1, it's like the same as just playing 0 or 1, but now I use continuous, uh, infinitely many messages. So it's not a restriction that I only use two types of messages. Uh, <clears throat> it's quite general, it works for any single peak preferences for uh, quasi-concave utility functions in the multidimensional world. And we achieved uh, the result even for quite large biases. So you remember uh, when we had no <coughs> information relation or almost no information relation in Prophet Sobel with just one uh, sender and one receiver. Now we have a uh, relation. So the biases are quite high. 